Hello, church, and welcome to the next part of our Wednesday online services. We're going to continue in our Old Testament series. Last week, we looked at the cities of refuge, and uh, several months before coronavirus hit, we were into the tabernacle and the priesthood garments and the various spiritual pictures there. And so we're going to continue on today in the book of Numbers, chapter 5. We're going to look at the bitter cup, the bitter cup. And we'll actually start in the New Testament here with Jesus in the garden as he is there praying in the garden of Gethsemane. It says in Luke chapter 22, verse 41, And as he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw from the disciples there, he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it be your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And so, uh, as Jesus prayed there in the, uh, the stress and agony of what he knew was coming ahead in the cross and the, and the blood beginning to come from his skin, he was asking God to take this cup from me. Take this cup, Lord, if it be your will, Father, take this cup away. Uh, what is that? cup that Jesus was referring to. Well, that's what we're going to look at, and that's what's described in a chapter in the Bible in Numbers chapter 5. And this is a, uh, a very foreign concept to us, and when we, you first read through it and look at it, it's going to seem absolutely barbaric, and it's going to be like, what on earth are these crazy backwoods people? How could they come up with something so horrible? But yet that was the cup, and we're going to look at the spiritual picture of what the cup of our sin that Jesus took upon himself and drank and pouring out the wrath of God's judgment upon himself there on the cross. And so um, this is a passage that uh, you have very likely never had a sermon preached to you before about. I know I've been in church all my life, grown up in church and Christian school chapel and Bible college chapel and all these things. And I have never heard a message on this passage. It's one that's not very popular and uh, one that doesn't get addressed very often. But there is uh, some spiritual truth in there, even though it is a little bit uh, tricky in with this. And so uh, let's look at this Numbers chapter 5, hear what it speaks, and also the spiritual pictures with this. Um, so what they would do, I'll, I'll just give you the basic summary first, is uh, if a man in the Old Testament legal system, if a man suspected that his wife was guilty of adultery, he would take her uh, there to uh, first the tabernacle and then later when the temple was built, he would take her there and they would do this ritual where they would offer a sacrifice, and they would take blood uh, from the laver, there the water basin outside where normally the priests would wash their hands. Uh, I, I said blood, I meant water. They would take water out of there and uh, uh, take water, and they would write some curses upon some paper and put it in the cup of water, and they would mix the paper and the curses that had been written on there and the water. They would mix it all together, and the woman would drink it, and if she was guilty of adultery, then it says her, uh, her belly would swell and her thigh would rot. But if she was innocent, then she would be fine, and she would continue on uh, bearing children and continue on being faithful to her husband. So uh, completely foreign, completely, oh, you know, horrible things today. And when you look at it on the surface, it's like, that is some messed up stuff for sure. But there is spiritual truth in this. And this is the cup that Jesus is describing there in the garden. So uh, first we learn from this, only the wife could be unfaithful. Only the wife could be unfaithful. That's what the, the passage says. There is no, as this is often called the test of adultery here described in this chapter, uh, a real popular uh, sermon title, put that on YouTube for you. But uh, the test of adultery, there is no test of adultery for the men, for the husband. Now, obviously, you know, men can commit adultery just as well as women, as wives can. But in the biblical legal system, the test was only for the woman. You know, now, well, that's unfair, whatever. Again, spiritual picture. Let's look at this first of all. So uh, Numbers chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and behaves unfaithfully toward him, and a man lies with her carnally, and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband, and is concealed that she has defiled herself, and there was no witness against her, nor was she caught, then, verse 14, if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife who's defiled herself, or if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife, although she has not defiled herself, then the man shall bring his wife to the priest. He shall bring an offering required for her, one-tenth of an elaph of barley meal, and it continues on, the various other things that they were 
supposed to bring. And so uh, just strange in a lot of ways this um, going on, but it, yeah, there was no test for the woman there. Now, of course, uh, this is a uh, sort of a sucker punch for those that want to attack the Bible, uh, the feminists, militant feminists, and the social justice warriors and things out there, just like, oh, you know, the Bible's oppressive to women and barbaric in many ways, and you know, all these things, that, uh, the same arguments that get brought on over and over and over again. But again, we have to see there's a spiritual picture that goes on with here spiritually, and that, uh, as we'll look at here, often... Uh, Israel is being referred to as the wife, uh, the, the nation of Israel is referred to the wife of Jehovah, of the Lord, and that she, when she goes away to serve and worship idols, she's committing adultery against him. And the same in the New Testament, that the church is likened to the bride of Christ. And so uh, there, when we see uh, in these things, uh, what the Bible says that uh, in the marriage relationship of either the nation of Israel or later of the church to God, uh, only one person can be unfaithful in that relationship. And I'll give you a hint. It's not God. He's not going to be unfaithful there. So only <laughs> that's why only the wife in the Old Testament, only there's only a test of adultery for the wife because only the wife is capable of being unfaithful in the big spiritual picture that the Lord is trying to teach us here. And so, um, and, and this is a big deal in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of stuff. I don't want to be crude to go into this, but uh, there's some very detailed instructions in the Old Testament how, uh, virginity uh, for men and for women was a very sacred thing and protected, and especially uh, girls, because marriage and bearing children was so important uh, for them and for their purpose in life that uh, their virginity was something guarded very closely by their fathers and by their family. And a lot of uh, biblical instructions and things go on with that protection. And it was so much to where if a girl was defiled by a man, if she was raped or assaulted in any ways, that uh, that was chargeable by death, uh, clearly in the Bible. And there's different circumstances. There's, you know, the Bible has things for shotgun weddings and, and various things of uh, people who made mistakes, like during their engagement time. But, but for s someone who just committed outright rape, that was punishable by death, indeed. That's how a, a girl's virginity was likened to her life, and to take one was the equivalent of taking the other there in the Old Testament system. And so, uh, that was how uh, deeply entrenched this was in their society and, and the culture where these laws are established. And that, even though that seems really weird and foreign, because uh, it hasn't been that way for a generation or two, in fact, in the United States, rape, uh, first degree rape, there was a punishable, could be, you could face the death penalty for that, uh, that crime for rape in the United States all the way up until 1977 a generation and a half ago, essentially. And so uh, there, yeah, this isn't some foreign thing. And yet, you know, as we lessen the crimes and the uh, sentences for these crimes, how does that help our society uh, very much? And we see this also in the New Testament with, um, with Joseph and Mary at the birth of Jesus, that when Mary uh, is, begins to show the signs of pregnancy as she's carrying Jesus, as was revealed to her by the angel, uh, Joseph doesn't know what to think of this at first, and Joseph, according to the system that they lived in, Joseph had the legal right to have Mary go through this and go through the tests of adultery, and it could even have had her stoned because he knew that he was not the father for sure, uh, but Joseph, the Bible says he was a just man, and he chose not to carry out that sentence, and instead, in his patience and his self-control, the angel speaks to him and explains that uh, Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit and that salvation will come through the child that Mary brings. And we see this, this spiritual picture there, though, that um, Israel or that the church is the bride of the Lord. There, Jer many, many Old Testament passages explain this. I'll just mention two here. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 7. How else shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me, have sworn by those that are not gods. When I had fed them to the fool, then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by truths by troops in the harlots' houses. So you're saying that those that went to serve idols, they were spiritually committing adultery there in their relationship with God. Also, the book of Hosea, the entire book there, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, uh, Then the Lord said to me, to the prophet Hosea, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. The raisin cakes, the offerings that they would bring to the false gods. And so 
the Hosea was told to marry uh, a woman who sold her body there and involved in that trade and uh, told to marry her as the spiritual picture of the Lord loving Israel, even though they were unworthy and even though they cheated on him over and over and over. That we see that. And also, uh, it's not on the screen here, but Ephesians chapter 5 says that the church is the bride of Christ and that uh, we're loved. Uh, by him that Jesus, he loved us and gave himself for us. And so, and he wants his church to be without spot and without wrinkle. And again, in that marriage relationship, it's not possible for God to lie. It's not possible for him to cheat or be unfaithful. Only, only the wife can be, only the church can be unfaithful to Christ, or only Israel can be unfaithful to the Lord. And so there's the, uh, the spiritual picture of that aspect there that is only the test of adultery is only for the woman because that's is the relationship with the lord only one party can be unfaithful and it's not him also we see secondly what was done in this is that uh, the holy water mixed with the law brings judgment again this connects back to my previous lessons on the tabernacle and things you can go back and watch many of those if you're a little lost but uh the water of the laver, the wash basins, that bird bath type structure there on the outside of the tabernacle or of the temple, that is uh, the water and it's called holy water. And uh, not holy in that, you know, it doesn't like kill vampires or anything, you know, that's all fake anyways, but, you know, not that kind of sense, but it, holy, it's set apart, it's sacred for the things of the Lord. And so uh, the priests, as they would uh, be offering the sacrifices for animals, they would have to go dip their hands in the water before they could go inside the tabernacle and carry the blood uh, within from the sacrifice, if it was that kind of sacrifice. And so uh, that, that water there in the laver, that's always used for washing over and over, for washing, and the picture of the Word of God, the washing of the water by the Word, the New Testament says. And that was never consumed at any time. You never drank that water, except for right here, this one instance there in the test of adultery, and so uh, Numbers chapter 5, verse 17 uh, says, The priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel and shall take some of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. And so uh, not only is it the water by himself, but he reaches down and uh, the tabernacle would have just a dirt floor or later the, the temple's going to have uh, tiles and, and stone pavers there as its floor, but there would still be dust within. So he takes some dust and he mixes it in with the water. Now, uh, that's very important because we see in uh, the system here that, that that's a curse that comes with that. The, the water mixed with dust or mixed with the law, there's a curse that goes with that. And so uh, the first reference that we have to dust in the scripture is there in the book of Genesis. After the Lord forms Adam out of the dust, and then when Adam and Eve sin, what does God say to them? He says, you're going to die. They didn't drop dead right then, but their bodies began the process of dying. And they would die and their bodies would decay and return back to dust. So dust is a picture of the curse there. So he takes this holy water and he mixes the dust in with it. That's a curse. But not just that, but he also, he takes a piece of, it's not paper like we think of it, not paper uh, from wood necessarily. They had paper out of like um, reeds and uh, different plant stalks that they would press together. So a very flimsy type of paper. It doesn't last very long. And they also... Uh, would take a ink, and it was a plant-based ink, and so not like our inks from a you know a, a ballpoint pen or something that we uh, have things inks that will tend to uh, last if it gets a little bit wet or something. Uh, not so in Bible times that their ink, uh, because it was organic-based, it would dissolve. Just a little bit of water would wash away everything someone had written on a piece of paper, and the paper itself would dissolve with just a, a decent amount of water on it. And so he writes some curses here upon this paper. Uh, with his ink, and he puts that. So you got the water, and you got dust, and then you got the the law, the the curses written there upon the paper and the ink, and that's thrown in there, and it's all stirred together. Again, uh, as it says, Numbers five, verse twenty-three. Then the priest shall write these curses in a book. He shall scrape them off into the bitter water, and he shall make the woman drink the bitter water that causes a curse, and the water that brings the curse shall enter into her to become bitter. So, again, this seems barbaric to us and very strange, but that's what they would do. They would put the ink and the paper and the, uh, the dust and everything together into the water, and then she would have to drink that. Now, uh, when I was a boy, uh, we would go, most of my, uh, my grandparents on my mom's side and many of my aunts and uncles all lived in Virginia Beach, 
there. And so uh, we would go about once a year to see the family and see all my cousins and aunts and uncles. And one time we were visiting family and my dad had uh, the idea that, well, hey, let's all, let's have all the uncles. We'll all watch the kids for one afternoon and let all the aunts go off and they can get a pedicure, or, you know, get their hair done or something and give them a break. And all us uncles will take care of the cousins and we'll keep the kids alive. And so uh, that was the plan. And uh, so my mom and her sisters went off together. And uh, so as they were watching us kids, they put in a movie for us to watch. And it was a movie, Ernest Goes to Jail. And, uh, and, and there's a scene in this movie where Ernest, he's on the jury and it's a complicated movie with the, you know, they switch him for someone else, a criminal that's in there. But as he's on the jury uh, watching this, and he's a total goofball and a klutz in many ways, he's got an ink pen on the scene and he's in the jury and uh, he keeps the ink pen in his mouth. Well, he bites on it so hard that he cracks the pen and the ink begins leaking out over his face and he, and he tries to hide it and he ends up smearing it all over his face and as he pulls some paper off his notebook and he tries to wipe it off with his the paper and it just smears it even more and at the end he just crumples it up and he uh he throws it in his mouth and he's just chewing on the ink and the paper there in his mouth well i can't remember exactly how old probably eight you know seven or eight or so at the time of watching this and this is very disgusting to me as a little kid uh, watching this scene as he's got this ink and this paper and so i throw up there among my cousins watching this film well uh, some of my uncles, they were a little on the queasier side. And while the movie wasn't anything to them, seeing a kid throw up, that caused them to throw up. And so we just had this uh, chain of reaction and unfortunate events that all uh, connected together there through uh, the movie that happened and just unfortunate in its outcome with that. But that's essentially what happens there uh, with the test of adultery, how the uh, the woman, she's supposed to drink the water that's got the paper and it's got the ink and it's got the dust. It's got everything mixed together. For a, a kind of a rough concoction uh, there, essentially. But that water from the labor, uh, when you've got dust with the curse of Adam and death in there and you've got the law in there, there's going to be a curse that's involved with that water. However, the way the water normally would be used was to be used for the washing of the blood. We see in Exodus chapter 30, uh, verse 19, Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet and water from it when they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. And so that's a very important uh, law that they had to follow. The priest, he, if they went inside the tabernacle before washing, they would be struck dead by the Lord for uh, disobeying that command or for skipping it. They had to go through the laver and wash their hands there in the water. And uh, that, that you go to the altar first and kill the animal at the altar and then go to the wash basin. That's what we see spiritually with Jesus, that the water, when it's mixed with blood, that brings redemption and it brings salvation. But it, when it's not mixed with blood, when it's mixed with dust and mixed with the law, then it brings a curse. We see that when Jesus is on the cross, John chapter 19, verse 34, says, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And so when they ran the spear in Jesus' side there on the cross to make sure he was dead, and when they pulled it out, the Apostle John is standing there, and he sees both blood and water coming out of the side of Jesus at the same time, blood mingled with water there. And the only way that happens in the human body is when a person has died of heart rupture. Jesus was already dead, and he had died of a broken heart there at the end of his time on the cross. And so we see that the blood and the water together, that salvation is brought through that. But the water with the dust and with the law, a uh, dangerous mixture and, and the curse that comes with that. And so uh, also with that, the, the sacrifice that they would bring uh, the husband, if he suspected his wife of adultery, it was only uh, flour and other things that he would bring, various crops. There was no blood with that sacrifice. They did not bring an animal to be slaughtered. And so it's a bloodless sacrifice. And, and there, every kind of sin sacrifice had to have blood with it to have forgiveness of sins. And so uh, to be a bloodless sacrifice, that's not going to do anything to prevent uh, the sin or, or pass that on to the animal in any sense in the spiritual picture there. And then thirdly, we see with this test, we see that whoever drank the cup took the punishment. And so in the way this is described in the Old Testament, the wife is to drink this, and uh, if she's guilty, it will affect her gravely uh, on her body. But if she is innocent, then she should be fine. Verse 26 of Numbers chapter 5, 
And the priest shall take a handful of the offering as its memorial portion, burn it on the altar, and afterward make the woman drink the water. And when he has made her to drink the water, then it shall be, if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully toward her husband, that the water that brings a curse will enter her and become bitter, and her belly will swell and her thigh will rot, and the woman will become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she shall be free and may conceive children. So, um, in the Bible, and again, we have to look at it not through our modern 2020 America uh, culture and vision, but through Bible times. In the Bible, uh, bearing children was one of the highest honors for women to have whatsoever. And we see that many times, why uh, barrenness and unable to conceive children is such a a burden on women. We see that with uh, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and other ones there in the scripture. And uh, what an honor it was for them. And uh, part of that was all the way in the book of Genesis when God tells Eve that her seed would crush the head of the woman, that every Jewish girl was looking forward to the day when she could have children with the hope that maybe her son would be that one, would be the promised Messiah who would crush the deeds of the serpent and put to end the reign of sin in our world. And uh, so they, they look forward to that through the joy of children, but also through the hope of the Messiah that God had promised. And so to not be able to have children, that was a, very much a stigma and a, a shame upon them in that culture, in the teachings of the rabbis uh, there during the New Testament time of Paul and of the apostles. Uh, they ranked those that were shunned, those that were outcasts of society, and uh, the most regarded uh, the the worst kind of person would be lepers, and then after them would be the blind and the poor, and then right after them, so the third worst people in society would be women who were unable to bear children. And so uh, that was just the shame that the, that society put on them. And so we see there, uh, the but it, the curse came upon whoever drank it. So if the wife drinks it, if she is guilty, which in the spiritual picture of Israel or of the church being the wife of Christ, uh, yes, we are guilty. It's not like a suspicion of adultery. Yes, that we have gone astray from the Lord. We have committed sin against him. But uh, this Old Testament picture given, and yeah, it seems barbaric. There is no record in Scripture whatsoever that they actually perform this uh, at all. You can read the entire Old Testament and the New Testament. You never see this being carried out on anyone at any time. And uh, even in the Jewish uh, writings, there really isn't any kind of reference to it by the rabbis or the Talmud or the Jewish histories, Josephus or various ones. It's, it's not really mentioned at all. It's just there for the spiritual picture. And we see that in the spiritual picture, yes, we're guilty. That all of us, the bride of Christ, we're the wife there, guilty before the Lord, before our husband. And they're expected to drink this cup. And yet that's the very cup that Jesus, as the husband, Jesus reaches over and grabs that cup. Even though he's done nothing wrong, he grabs that cup and he drinks it himself. And he drains the dregs all the way to the bottom. And he drinks the entirety of that curse. And he takes that curse upon us. And as it, the Bible says that he was cursed there upon the tree on the cross. That all of the curse and guilt and shame and all the fury of God's wrath, those that have broken his law, that was poured upon Jesus those hours that he was upon the cross. And Jesus took that curse for us. And so as the husband, Jesus took the cup and he drank all of it. And he took that punishment that we deserved. He took it upon himself. That is the cup that Jesus mentions there in the garden. Father, let this cup pass from me. The cup of adultery, the cup of unfaithfulness, the cup of the curse, the dust, the law, the ink, everything in there. All of it that we deserve to take and that we deserve the punishment to, for our own sins, but yet Jesus, he didn't want us to go through that, and he wanted to offer a way of salvation, so he took the cup himself, and he drank it, and took all of our punishment upon himself, and through that, he's able to offer salvation to those that will accept it. So, again, that's a, I'm sure that's a message you've not heard before. It's a weighty chapter. It's not very popular, but that is the picture there in the scripture, what it teaches us, and of the spiritual truths, even in the book of Numbers, that the Lord has for salvation that he explains through these ways that are somewhat obscure and somewhat hidden. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for another chance to come before your word and to learn about you. And we ask that you would be with all of those in our congregation. May uh, we be led by your spirit and understanding your truth. And Lord, we know 
uh, even though we can't gather together as we would like, we thank you for the chance through technology and everything to still gather around your word and to learn about you. And uh, we know in the end what matters is our relationship with you. We thank you that you took the penalty that all of us deserve. You took that upon yourself, that you uh, could have denied that cup. You had every right to stop things and not go to the cross, but instead you took it completely and took all of the wrath that we all deserved upon yourself. And we praise you for that, Lord. And may you help us to grow in our love for you. In Jesus' name, amen.